Let's make this our prayer tonight. Holy unto you. Holy unto you. Hear this humble prayer and make me holy unto you. Kado Kadosh Laka Kadosh Kadosh 
la ca Hear this humble prayer Make me kadosh, kadosh la ca Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh la ca Kadosh, kadosh la ca This humble prayer make me kadosh, kadosh, laka. Holy unto you, holy unto you. Hear my humble prayer, make me holy unto you. Yes, Lord, we want to be holy for you are holy, Lord. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. Within me, I give you praise. All that I adore is in you. Lord, I give you my heart. Give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. Oh, let's sing this to him. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. within me Lord I give you praise all that I adore is in you Lord I give you my heart I give you my soul I live for you alone every breath that I take every moment I'm awake Lord have your way in me yes Lord that's our prayer Well, good evening, everyone. God bless you and welcome to Friday Night with Jesus. We are following him through his earthly ministry and we begin in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9. So why don't you go ahead and just open up your Bible and prepare your heart to hear from him 
and just once again on a Friday evening be astounded at the miraculous working power of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As you're turning over to Matthew 9, I just would like to say a great big uh, thank you. Our family is very grateful that you prayed for my father. His surgery was successful today. He is resting this evening and we are just grateful to the Lord uh, for his faithfulness and guiding and anointing the surgeon and also for our church family and you know church family is not just here at Calvary Inverness it's everyone who calls on the name of the Lord that you lifted up uh, Theodore Ballard my father uh, to the Lord so thank you very much this is also a great opportunity to remind you if you have a prayer request there's a comment section on our Facebook page and you can comment there and give your prayer request and we will be glad to agree in prayer with you for the Lord to do a work in your life. You can also email your prayer request to ccipprayer at calvaryinv.com. ccipprayer at calvaryinv.com. Matthew chapter 9, we'll begin in verse 18. Let's offer this up to the Lord. Father, we just thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, that when our bodies are broken, when our life is fallen apart, when it seems like our spirits are in the pit of despair, that we have you the author and finisher of our faith, a friend that sticks closer than a brother, a great physician, a Lord, a Savior, a Master, and a soon-coming King. And Lord, our hearts are always encouraged and lifted up as we read and hear from you, through your Holy Spirit all that you have done and all that you are willing to do. So Lord, as we come to this passion of Scripture, we ask that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a mind to understand what you, the Spirit, would say to us, the church. Give us a heart to receive this glorious gospel for it truly is glorious, and it is the good news that has transformed us from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, it cannot escape your attention. I, I know many of you know this, but as you watch the news, you have this, just a myriad of thoughts and emotions that you go through. Everything from anger to disgust to just, uh, wow, how far can man go in their depravity? How far can man go in their violence and their hatred for one another, but there's another emotion that comes over all of us who follow the Lord that is one of pity and sorrow because you look around and you realize that everything you are watching, everything you are seeing, everything you're feeling is because we live in a broken world full of broken people. Mark Taylor here at our fellowship was leading us through Genesis chapter 3 uh, Wednesday evening on the origin of sin and the fall of Adam and Eve. And as he was taking us through that chapter, and I'm comparing that to what I'm seeing happening in our nation, happening in our world, happening with people we know and uh, people we don't even know. And what's going on, you, just, you realize that we are still dealing with the consequences of what happened in the Garden of Eden. That truly, this is a broken, broken world. And Jesus Christ has come to heal the brokenhearted. Jesus Christ has come to heal the broken body. Jesus has come to heal the broken mind and the, the, the spirit. He's come to do all that. And we see this in Matthew chapter 9. He is in the city of Capernaum. And he's done 10, there's 10 astounding miracles that he performs. And it just, it's amazing to me. He does these things because he wants to show that he has power over every sickness, over every disease, over every demon, over every disaster, over every disability, and even over sin and death itself. But also we see as we follow him, especially tonight, there are, he has four encounters where he ministered to, ministers to four groups of broken people with a broken heart, broken bodies, again, a broken mind, and even a broken spirit. And he does this by embracing them, bringing them to himself. And one of the things that they all have in common is that Jesus actually touches each and every one of them. There's nothing like the human touch. One of the things that we faced as a community and as a nation is when we were in isolation, that lack of interaction with people. And especially those who are widowed or those who are alone in this world, it was really a very difficult time for them and all of us especially as Christians, miss not only the interaction of other Christians, but also the, the touch of another person, the hug, a handshake. And, you know, a smile over the Internet is always warm, but it's nothing like a human contact. And here we see Jesus reaches into the brokenness of these people's lives. He reaches in and he touches them in the midst of their brokenness. 
and his touch does not leave them in the uh, same pitiful condition. He actually touches their life and heals their life and restores them to wholeness. And again, this has taken place in the city of Capernaum. It tells us in verse 36 that when he saw the multitudes, and again, Bible scholars feel like there's anywhere between 10, 20, even upwards of 50,000 people that would follow Jesus at any one time, all thronging together, no social distancing there. And they, they were all just packed in there like sardines. Capernaum was a city maybe of 15,000 people, but they had come from all over. They had come all as far as Jerusalem, down from the south of Capernaum to the south part of Galilee, all all around northern Israel from Lebanon and even Syria and over to the east, which is now modern day Jordan. They'd all come there because of Jesus. And it says there in verse 36 that when he saw the multitudes, he had compassion on them because they were weary and scattered like sheep without a shepherd. That phrase, I believe, captures what's happening in our world today. Not just here in the United States, but literally across the globe. Weary and scattered like sheep without a shepherd. And if you study that, you find out that the phrase literally means weary and scattered. means that they're actually being skinned alive. Skinned alive by what's going on in this world. And Jesus had compassion. It's a very intense word. It means that literally the heaving of one's bosom, that he was actually moved to tears, moved to tears, moved emotionally by what he was seeing and actually what he was feeling, and it moved him to action. And so that's what Jesus looks at our life today. Listen, I know that there are many broken people out there tonight, and at one time or another, we're all going to have something break in our life. Our health breaks down. Maybe a marriage breaks down. You know, a relationship with your kids breaks down. Uh, your relationship with the Lord breaks down. There's, there's a brokenness that takes place. But understand that Jesus doesn't turn his back on your brokenness. Actually, he's drawn to your brokenness, and he wants to embrace you and actually heal you and restore those things that have been broken in your life. He wants you to be whole and not broken. So we begin in verse 18, and it says this, while he, while he spoke these things to them, he had just called Matthew to follow him, and he's speaking to uh, the disciples and just speaking to those who are following the Pharisees and the scribes. He says, while he spoke these things to him, behold, that's Matthew's way of saying, look, I want you to focus on this. A ruler came and worshipped him, that being Jesus, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. The ruler is a synagogue ruler. And that means that he was in charge of the order of the service of the synagogue. He did everything from making sure the doors were open when they came together to study God's word. He would make sure it was, the place was clean. He also gave order to the service. If there was a visiting rabbi, he would make sure that that rabbi had an opportunity to speak uh, uh, in the synagogue to the people that came and worship. And we also, it also believed that this synagogue ruler is one of the elders that came to Jesus earlier uh, in chapter 8 and said the Roman centurion is, uh, has a servant that is sick and he is worthy of you coming and attending to his servant because he helped build this synagogue. And so this synagogue ruler would have been the one who had come to Jesus earlier and said, look, this guy is worthy of you helping him. And Mark and Luke tells us his name was Jairus. So he's a very influential man. He's, of course, a very moral man, a very upright man, a very uh, esteemed man. And yet it says that he came to Jesus and worshipped him. Actually, and Mark describes it this way, he actually fell to the ground on his face and began to plead with Jesus. Not only was this something that a dignified man wouldn't do, but at this time, and the Pharisees are following Jesus, they are there, and the scribes are there, and Jairus would have been in full view of them, and Jesus is already at odds with these guys. They're already, their hatred is beginning to build inside of them. And yet, in spite of all that, he comes to Jesus in full public view with thousands and thousands of people uh, watching and falls on the ground and worships the Lord. And he said, my daughter has just died. Literally, she is as good as dead. So we find out that she's a little girl that's 12 years of age through the gospel account. 
and that we don't know how she got sick or how long she was sick, but it seems to indicate it was not something sudden, but it's something that's been taking place for a while, and it got to the point where Jairus knew, in spite of having to risk his job, risk his position uh, in the city, he had to go and get help. So the doctors apparently were not able to help, and it just came to the point where he had to do something. And look, you know what it's like being a father or even a, a mother. There's, you'll do anything you can to make sure that your child has everything they need to survive and to prosper in this life. And there had to be an internal war taking place inside of them. He knew what he was facing. But there came a point when he realized that if he did not do something, his little girl was going to die. So when he came to Jesus, he, in front of everybody, he fell on his face before him and said, My little girl is as good as dead. But listen to the faith that he had. But come, that's the faith, and lay your hands on her. Come and just touch her. And she will live. Think about that. He says in front of everybody, not care. Listen, when we're desperate enough, when we come to a point of desperation, we don't care what anybody else thinks. We don't care what anybody else is saying. We don't care what anybody else is doing. We are going in our desperation, and we are going to go to the Lord and in a desperate plea ask him to help. But understand that the Lord didn't say to Jairus, he's like, well, it's about time you got here. Where have you been? She'd been sick for a week or a month. Did you not notice that she wasn't bouncing around like every other 12-year-old girl? Did you notice that that sparkle in her eye had diminished? Did you not notice that she didn't care about combing her hair or dressing up? She didn't want to help her mom do anything? Where have you been? Oh, now you come to me. And sometimes Christians will do that to you. That They'll say, well, you should go to Jesus first. You know, when we're desperate enough, we'll just go to him. And Jesus is not going to reject it. He did not reject Jairus, and he will not reject us. Us. And sometimes, listen, sometimes the Lord allows us to come to a point of desperation where all we have is him. And so it says, he came and said, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. So how did Jesus respond? Again, did he get on to him? No. He responded to this synagogue ruler's faith. Because look at verse 19. So Jesus arose and followed him. And that's something good for us to remember. In our desperation... Jesus, it's not every, every time he heals, but there are many times he healed in response to someone's faith. Sometimes it's the person in need's faith. Sometimes it's the family and friends of that person in need. And of course, Jesus sometimes heals, and we don't know why he decides to do it. But there's no doubt about it that Jesus responds to our faith. And we're going to find out it doesn't take a mountain load of faith. It doesn't take great faith. It just takes faith. That is trusting in him. Listen to the trust this ruler had. Come and lay your hand on her and maybe she'll get better or maybe she'll make it through it. No, listen to the confidence and faith that he has in Jesus. Come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Do you hear the absolute in that? There's no ambiguity. There's no wishful thinking. And he had a hope, a hope that can only come by, through God. A hope and a confidence that if Jesus will come to my house, there's no doubt whatsoever that my little girl, my 12-year-old daughter, will live. Even though she's at the point of death. And I believe that's what Jesus wants us to know. If you're desperate tonight, if you're broken, and this father had a broken heart. We as parents understand the brokenness when we see a child sick and even a child pass away. And there are many watching tonight who know exactly uh, what this synagogue ruler was feeling. And look, it doesn't matter if they're 12 years old or 52 years old. They're still your baby. They're still your child. They still hurt with you. And so his heart was broken. And in his brokenness, what does he do? Not in despair, not in defeat, but in desperation, he runs to Jesus. Listen, no matter how bad it is tonight, no matter how difficult it may seem, no matter the odds that are against, again, Jairus says, she's as good as dead. That's what Matthew means here when he says that she, he came and said, my daughter has just died. She's as good as death. She's at the point of death. She's at the doorway of death. And if you come, you can sp spare her. But he knew his heart was broken. And what did he do in his brokenness? He ran to Jesus. Listen, whether it's a broken heart, 
a broken body, a broken spirit, or a broken mind, a broken relationship, whatever the case may be, in your brokenness, in the point of desperation, let us not just walk toward Jesus, but let us run toward him and fall at his feet. And you'll find out when you do that he will pick you up and embrace you in your brokenness and restore you to wholeness. Because that's exactly what happens. And Jesus rose and followed him. And so did his disciples. I love this about Jesus. He's going to heal this little girl. We know it's there. It's, but, of course, the father didn't have Matthew chapter 9. Nobody else had Matthew chapter 9 either. Or Mark chapter 5 or Luke chapter 8. Nobody had this. The father's confident. Jesus is confident. And Jesus brings his disciples because he knows he needs to build their confidence in what he is able and willing to do. And that's why we're doing what we're here doing on Friday night. We're following Jesus so we can have our faith built up so when desperate people come to us, we don't have to freak out. Well, I don't know what to do. I hope that works out for you. I have no clue whatsoever. You know, could you help me? My little daughter's about to die. Ooh, oh, oh, uh, well, have you called the pastor? No, the pastor's not available. Oh, what about one of the elders? No, you're it. Okay, hey, listen, if you have a migraine, maybe I could help you out here. If it's a common cold, keyword common, maybe I could help out here. But your little daughter's dying. Have you called the doctor? Yeah, we've called the doctor. Have you gone to the emergency room? Yeah, we've gone to the emergency room. And you, know, you understand why you freak out. But remember something. Healing's not your responsibility. It's his responsibility. It's his touch, not my touch. You know, listen, if, if I touch somebody, I can be a portal through which he works, but that's it. I'm just a conduit. You're just a conduit. I can't heal anybody, neither can you. And isn't that good news? I mean, I would sweat it out if people thought I was a healer because then it's all the responsibilities on me. But when I realize that all I'm supposed to do is act in faith, then it's all good because it's he that does the work. It's his work. There's no sweat involved here. There's no laboring involved here. It's the work of God. And so he brings the disciples along so that he may work through them and prepare them for ministry once he ascends to heaven at the right hand of the Father. So he rose and followed him, and so did his disciples. Verse 20, and so we have what's called a divine interruption. By the way, Jairus did not see what was about to happen as the divine interruption. It was total frustration for him. It was total impediment of what he needed Jesus to do. And maybe sometimes you feel, you don't think this, but you feel like, is Jesus being distracted? Because I asked him to do something, and I felt like he was right there with me, but all of a sudden, I'm not feeling anything. I'm not seeing anything. And it, what happened, it says in verse 20, and suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. So here you have a multitude of people thronging around Jesus. Jesus is now following the synagogue ruler. And you can imagine the hope of the synagogue ruler as they were following him, thinking, okay, this is going to be it. Jesus will come. He's going to touch my little girl, and everything's going to be good. She'll be back up and playing with her friends and playing with her dolls and playing dress up and being the, the apple of my eye and being the light of my life. Everything is going to work out. And all of a sudden, boom, here's a woman. And this woman had no business being in the multitude and had no business trying to touch Jesus, who they saw as a rabbi, a teacher. Why? Because she had a blood flow of, for 12 long years. It was her menstrual cycle. She had been in, internally bleeding for 12 long years. And there's ramifications. She had a broken body, which meant that she had a broken life. Because of the internal blood flow, because of her constantly bleeding, being on her menstrual cycle, according to Old Testament law, first of all, she was ceremonially unclean. She could not come to the synagogue. She could not come to the temple. Not only was she she's unclean ceremonially, she, that means that she was religiously unclean. She was also uh, sexually unclean. She could not have intimate relations with her uh, husband. And because of the length of this, her husband, according to the law, had every right to divorce her. And that means that she uh, may, may not have children. And so you can understand that her brokenness in her body caused, broke her life. 
And so here she is. She's an unclean woman, ostracized from society. And she was probably a very young woman. If she was still experiencing her monthly period, she was very young. So here she is living in isolation. She couldn't be around anyone. How long had it been since she experienced a human touch? How long had it been since she was embraced by her husband if she did have a husband? Was he still there or did he divorce her or did he stay away from her if he was still married? Maybe he just left the home and left her on her own. And by the way, in that day, the husband was the support for the wife. And if, the, and if the husband was gone, then the oldest son would support the, uh, his mother. So because of her condition, she would have had no support whatsoever. So just as Jairus had come to a point of desperation, this woman was at a point of desperation. Mark tells us that she spent everything she had on doctors, and instead of getting better, she became worse. And you can imagine that. And you know, some of you, and maybe many of you know exactly what she was feeling. You've gone, you've had CAT scans, and you've had blood tests, and you've had urine tests, and you've had surgical procedures, and they prescribe this medicine and that medicine, and instead of getting better, you become worse. Nothing's working. And so you can understand how desperate she is. She can't work. She can't be in a marital relationship. She cannot bear children. She cannot go to the synagogue. She cannot go to the temple and make the proper sacrifices. She is outside the family of God. And by the way, it's also representative of what we were before Jesus Christ. We were ceremonially unclean. There was no, we could not approach God. We could not worship God because we were dead in our sins and trespasses. And we had a blood poison problem. It was the blood poison of sin. And so this woman, in her desperation, she says to herself, I don't care what anybody else says. I don't care what anybody else does. I'm going to go to where this man is. I'm going to break my way through the crowd. Could you imagine the expressions of people? Because, listen, 15,000 people in Capernaum. Uh, we don't know if she's from Capernaum. Some actually think, some Bible scholars think, that she's as far away as Caesarea Philippi. But here she is in Capernaum. She's not, anybody say, can you imagine the glares? It's kind of like you going to the grocery store and you went down the wrong aisle. It says one way and you went down the other, that type, that type of glare. Or you go into a place and everybody has a mask on but you, and they all give you the evil eye. So th you can imagine the humiliation, you can imagine what this woman was feeling, but she didn't care. She was desperate. And she said to herself, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, then I shall be healed. Now, it's actually a little superstitious what she's believing, but the hymn, it had to do with the tassels. In the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy, Jewish men would put blue tassels in the hem of the bottom part of their garment, and it was to remind them to obey and, uh, the law of God, to remember God's law and to obey it. And so that blue tassel became a mark of a man devoted to God. Jesus actually chastised the Pharisees because he said, you made your so big so everybody could see how holy you are, and yet you do everything outwardly, but inwardly your heart's far from me. But she thought, if I could just touch a man of God, if I could just touch a holy man, if I could just get to this guy, then I know that I will be made whole. Now, what's amazing to me, again, this is a little bit superstitious, and we see it still going today. If I can get to this evangelist, if I can get this evangelist to pray over me, if I can get to this crusade and they anoint me with oil, then I know I would be made whole. And, but yet we're told all we have to do is ask in the name of Jesus, and we can have what we need. But understand, Jesus doesn't rebuke this woman. I find that amazing. I was sharing with someone... Well, we were talking about different groups of people and their bad theology, and, you know, and I said something. Finally, I said, you know, it's a good thing that we're saved by faith and not good doctrine. <laughs> because if we were saved by good doctrine, there would be a lot of people not making it. But we're saved simply by our faith in Jesus Christ. So even in her uh, superstition, Jesus met her at her point of desperation and even her superstition. He came to her point of faith. It says, and suddenly a woman had a flow of blood for 12 years, came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, if I only may touch his garment, I shall be made well. She acted on her faith. And so, again, I know Jesus doesn't condemn her. Jesus doesn't mock her. Jesus doesn't ridicule her. And it's, listen, it's a good reminder to me 
that when I hear some of the superstitious things that Christians do, is just to pray for the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of their heart to see that they don't have to do all that. They can just simply approach the throne of grace boldly, the book of Hebrews says, in their time of need. That's it. But Jesus doesn't condemn her. What does he do? But Jesus turned around. Again, he's responding to her faith. Superstitious faith, weak faith, probably a little uh, weird type of faith. But here it is. He turns around. And Luke, it says this. He says, who touched me? And the disciples are like, wow, man, it's the heat of the day. Lord, is it getting to you? Is the heat, is the sun getting to you? What do you mean, who touched you? There's 50,000 people. He said, no, someone touched me in faith. Because I felt power leave my body. I want to be that type of person. Where Jesus, I want to touch Jesus in such a way with my faith, he feels the power coming from him to meet the need that I have in my life. This is incredible uh, uh, faith that this girl has in Jesus. Jesus turned around when he saw her. He said this, be of good cheer. Stop being afraid and believe. That's the Stop uh, fearing, be believing. It's an ongoing tense, the I-N-G. Stop fearing, be believing. What an amazing thing. And then he says something to her that he says to nobody else in the New Testament. He calls her daughter. It's in a diminutive form, which means my little child, my baby girl. My daughter. It's a type of word that Jairus would have used for his daughter. And here, how long it had been since she'd heard a kind word. How long it had been since she was, someone was not repelled by her touch. And that someone would actually focus in on her. Listen, there's a lot. It's not just women. There's a lot of men and women who feel totally rejected by this world. Rejected by their family. Rejected by their friends rejected by society and listen when we are rejected like that we can do some weird and even atrocious things again jesus saying like weary and scattered sheep without a shepherd being skinned alive and yet instead of humiliating her instead of pointing his finger at her and tell her scold instead of scolding her and telling her to study up on some doctrine then come see him he says stop fearing be believing my little girl, my precious daughter. Jesus does that for us in our brokenness. Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith in Jesus. Listen, she said his hymn, the hymn of his garment, has made you well. Literally has made you whole. What is evident here, whether you see it or not, and some translations have a good word, has saved you or has made you whole, or has made you physically well. And I think the word, the word whole catches both of them. He healed her not only physically, but also spiritually. Why? Because of her faith. We don't know if she was an immoral woman. We don't know if she was a promiscuous woman. We don't know if she was a good, noble woman. But because of her simple faith in Jesus in the midst of her broken body, which has broken her life and smashed it to smithereens, he said, you are healed physically. And more than that, you are healed spiritually. Because she would go on and live a life and one day eventually get sick and die. But that wouldn't be the last word on her. For she is in heaven today in a perfectly whole, strong body in, in a glorified state with her Lord and Savior forever. Now church tradition says, it teaches, not the Bible, but church tradition again says she was from Caesarea Philippi, that she returned home and her name was Veronica. Again, that's not what the Bible says, but it's just interesting and in that she actually became a, a pro, she had lost everything as a businesswoman trying to get better. And when Jesus healed her, she went back home, she rebuilt her business, became very, very prosperous and actually made a bronze statue of herself lying on the ground at the feet of of Jesus. Don't know if that's true, but it just seems like, you know, it's amazing when God touches someone's life, 
how they, instead of tearing things down and blowing things up, whether it's a marriage or one's health or blowing a relationship with their kids or actually buildings these days, instead of blowing things up, they're actually building things. They're actually doing something constructive. And again, I say that and remind you, listen, nobody wants to see our cities burned down. It's atrocious what's taking place. It's anarchy. But realize that's broken people that we're looking at. And that even though law and order must be restored, Jesus has come not just to restore law and order, but to make whole those who are broken. He loves every one of Antifa. He loves Black Lives Matter. He loves the white liberal. He loves the black liberal. He loves the white conservative and the brown liberal conservative. It all goes on and on and on. Jesus loves people. And in the midst of our brokenness, if we who are Christians keep preaching Jesus to the people, they can be like Jairus and they can be like Veronica, if that's what her name, and Jesus will meet them at their point of desperation embrace them in their brokenness and make them whole what a beautiful message that is who wants to argue about politics all the time let's give him jesus because he's the answer it's not our president it's not a king or a queen it's not any politician aren't you glad about that it's not any of these people it's Jesus. Jesus is the answer to all the ills of society, to all the broken things in this world. Jesus Christ is the answer. And he has come to heal people in their brokenness. And it says here in verse 23, now, nowhere does it tell us what Jairus is feeling. And Jairus is watching on this like, well, good for her. <laughs> Jesus, I really need you to come to the house. Now that we got Veronica taken care of, could we move on with my problem? I don't know if he felt that. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he was just happy that Jesus was making progress toward his house. But, you know, there had to be that apprehension. Is he going to get there in time? Is he going to get there in time? It says in verse 23, when Jesus had come into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, make room for the girl is not dead but sleeping, and they ridiculed him. So they make it to his house, and there were professional mourners. It was a part of Jewish society, and because uh, the synagogue ruler is probably an affluent man, there were many musicians and many uh, mourners. The more mourners you had, the more musicians you had. It shows you where you were in society. Uh, Jewish tradition said that even the poorest, the poor, should have at least two or three mourners and one or two flute players and they, because they really show dignity to the body of someone that's deceased. And so here you have, and the wailing, I mean, it had to be ear-piercing. They probably heard it long before they made it to the house. And you can imagine this father, broken in his heart, thinking, oh, no, it's too late. How long did it take him to get to Jesus? How long did he wait to get to Jesus? But apparently it was long enough that they'd already brought the professional mourners in and the wailing and the crying and the sorrow that was going on. As a pastor, I've done many memorial services. And I'll tell you one thing. There is a difference between a funeral for a Christian and a funeral for a non-Christian. And there's a big difference to Christians who attend funerals and non-Christians attend funerals. Look, there's always sadness. Death brings sadness. The Bible says that. We experience that. We know that. But we also have a hope of seeing our loved one again because they have placed their faith in Jesus. But you go to a funeral service and the mourning and the crying and sometimes even the screaming because they, that's it. I'll never see them again. They are in eternity and there's, they're lost for all of eternity or they have no hope of heaven whatsoever. And so here, many of them were crying and shrieking. And, and you can imagine all the pandemonium. And it's during this time that Mark tells us that one of the servants came uh, to Jairus before they made it to the house and said, don't bother the master anymore. Your daughter is dead. I mean, that had to be like a punch in the gut. He went from the pendulum of up and then down of hope and hopelessness and apprehension and is it possible? And I, I'm, I don't know if I want to believe this is going to happen. And then the finality of it, you hear the mourners, you hear the musicians, and then the servants come and tell you that she is dead. And Mark tells us that as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of his synagogue, again, just like he said to this woman who was bleeding, stop fearing, be believing. Listen. 
There's a lot of things in our life that are at the do death's door, or at the point of death. If not physically, then some in our relationships, and on and on and on. But here it is. Even if something dies, does not mean that Jesus is not able to bring it back to life. He wants to say to us, in our desperation and in our brokenness, stop fearing. Be believing. The word believe is a very interesting word. John, in his gospel, uses it 98 times. He never uses the noun faith, only the action verb believe. And it literally means to believe and keep on believing. In spite of the circumstances, in spite of what you're seeing or what you're feeling or what you're hearing, you put your faith in Jesus. You put your trust in Jesus and keep trusting him no matter what. And you, listen, you're talking about a test of faith. Your daughter's dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. He turns and says, here's my word to you. Stop fearing. Be believing. And then when they got to the house, again in verse 24, he says, He said to them, make room, make room, for the girl is not dead. And they're probably like, oh, what do you mean the girl's not dead? Because you had all these mourners there and all the family there and, you know, comforting the mother, comforting the other siblings, waiting for the father to come back and see if he could bring the teacher, the healer with him. And something happened, but he made it too late. He said to them, make room, literally clear the room, get out. And then he says something totally just bizarre, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And what was the response? They ridiculed him. Like, Jairus, come on, man. Don't listen to this guy. Let's show your daughter some dignity. Let's bury her proper. This is, this is blasphemous. This is crazy. You're out there. Don't let your grief over, uh, overwhelm your sense of logic. And you can hear it on and on. Listen, some of you guys are facing this. There's something in your life that has died. And like Lazarus, it's been dead for days. And you're being ridiculed. And, so even, your, and even the enemy of your soul ridicules you. You thought God was going to come through. You thought God was for you. You're a hypocrite. You know that you're paying for your sins. No, you're not paying for your sins. Jesus paid for your sins. So that can't be it. And so you can understand where, what Jairus is feeling at this time. And so Jesus puts everyone out of the room. And it says in verse 25, but when the crowd was put outside. And the reason Jesus did this is not that he needed to clear the room so he could build up his own faith. He didn't do that. Luke tells us that Peter, James, and John were in there with him along with the, the Jairus and his wife. He did that to protect Jairus' faith. Don't you love that about Jesus? He protects our faith. He knows how fragile we are. He knows the Looney Tunes of the world and how they get to us. He knows our adversary and how he lies to us. And so he puts all the people, all the naysayers, all the mark, uh, mockers, all those who are laughing on the inside, thinking that well, Jairus has lost his mind listening to this guy. He puts them all to protect Jairus' faith. And, and it just reminds me, sometimes when I'm in desperation... I need to unplug from all the voices. Unplug from all the voices so I can hear the voice of my master. So I can hear the one who is able to give life. What do you need to unplug from? What do you need to silence in your life? And there's many things. Listen, we're bombarded all day long. We're all on sensory overload. And it's good sometimes just to back away a little bit. It's like, you know, stopping sugar, you, you get a headache from it. Or stopping coffee, you get a headache from it and maybe get a little nauseous from it. But then all of a sudden, you start feeling better. It's the same thing with all the media that we have today. And all the things that we're going here and going there and doing this and doing that. Sometimes it's good just to step back and unplug. And I believe that Jesus was trying to help Jairus in his faith. Jesus protects our faith. I love that about him. But when the crowd was put outside, he went and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. He touched her. Jesus, because he was a rabbi, had no business touching a dead body because it would make him ceremonially unclean. And yet he was not fearful of what anybody was going to say, and he knew that there was nothing that could make him unclean. Actually, his touch makes the unclean clean. His touch makes the dead live. His touch makes the broken whole. 
he touched her and he arose. And then the report of this went out into all that land. Now, verse 27 says, when Jesus departed from Jairus' house, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, crying out means they were pleading for mercy, and saying, son of David, have mercy on us. And they're interesting. They couldn't see physically, but they had more insight than all the other religious leaders. The religious leaders could see, but they were blind. The blind men couldn't see, but yet they knew who Jesus was. They, they knew he was, son of David, they means that he's the Messiah. You are the anointed one. You are from God. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, do you, do you believe, literally, do you really believe that I am able to do this? It's a divine test. Because the word able means, do you really believe that I have the divine power? You see, these two men had been disabled. And you can imagine all the ramifications Many of us have disabilities. Disabilities we feel like that if we did not have, then we would be farther along in life. Sometimes it's a physical disability. Sometimes it's a mental disability. And even emotional disabilities come about from uh, tragedies and circumstances in one's life. And so we feel like, you know, if I didn't have this disability, if I did not, then I'd be able to get ahead in life. If, if I didn't have this disability, if I was always afraid of men, then I could find a husband that could truly love. If I wasn't always afraid of women, then I could have a, a wife. And be, if I didn't have this uh, physical disability, I could have children. And we just feel like we've been limited. And what do they do in their disability? What should we do in our disability? We go to God and ask for mercy. That's what they did. They recognized that Jesus was the Messiah. They recognized that if anybody could do it, he could. So Jesus tests their face. Do you really believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, yes, Lord. God knows the limits of our faith. He knows what we can and cannot take. And so he tests them, knowing what answer he would receive. And then it says here in verse 29, and there again, the touch of Jesus. He touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith. And don't miss this, please. See the phrase, according to your faith. Some people say, well, it's the amount of faith that these two men had that healed them. Matthew never puts the emphasis on faith as he much on Jesus' authority and power. There's no doubt that Jesus responds to faith. He responded to Jairus' faith. He responded to the woman with the issue of blood's faith. He's responding to these two blind men's faith. But the phrase, according to your faith, literally means this. Since you have faith. Jesus never mentions the amount of faith. But since you have faith. It's just a little bit of faith. There may be a whole lot of doubt that goes with it. But it's just that little bit of faith. It's the object of your faith that makes things possible, not the degree of your faith. You can have great faith in an object that's not able to do what you need it to do, but Jesus is the object of our faith, and he's able to do anything. So let me read it this way. He says, since you have faith, let it be to you. And what happened? And their eyes were opened. And then Jesus does something that is easy to pass by, and we just relegate it to the pages of the New Testament history. But I think it's something worth looking into. It says, And their eyes were open, and Jesus sternly, otherwise that he was deeply serious about what he's about to say, warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. And what we're going to find out, that these two men had faith in Jesus, but what they lacked was obedience. Because Jesus said for... There's numerous reasons why he said this, but it doesn't matter. Sometimes Jesus asks us, and sometimes he's deeply serious about, he's asking us not to do something. He sternly warned them, seeing that no one knows it. I heard one pastor say that it's because that there's some things that Jesus wants to keep between you and him. It shows you because Jesus wants a deep, personal, intimate relationship with you. There's some things. Look, we're always encouraged to share our testimony. But here's the one time, I don't know why, Jesus says, I don't want you to share this. I don't want you to do this. And there's all kinds of theological reasons for it. But what's more important for me is that Jesus said, don't do this. I may not fully understand that. I may not fully grasp that. But how much better it is when I just do what Jesus tells me to do. He's not going to ever clobber someone for doing what they believe Jesus is telling them to do. 
He sternly warned them. <laughs> what did they do? But when they had departed, verse 31, they spread the news about him. Well, at least they centered their testimony on Jesus. But I go back to, and I don't want to, it doesn't take away from the miracle. It doesn't take away from the disability that he healed them of. But I think it's something that we need to remember that sometimes that Jesus tells us to do something and we're just better off in doing it. And then finally we come to verse 32 and it says, As they went out, these two blind men, behold, they, we don't know who they are, brought to him, Jesus, a man, mute and demon-possessed. And apparently there was a, this man had a demon that was causing him to be mute and probably also deaf, a deaf mute that was brought about from a spiritual being. And now there's no doubt that not every sickness is from a demon, but in this case, it was something that was supernatural, that this man was demon-possessed, was taken over by a demon, and it caused him to be deaf, and it caused him to be mute. He was unable to hear and unable to speak. And you can imagine, man, he had a broken spirit, and he couldn't communicate with anyone. And, in this, and we read about what demons did to people and how they just ostracized them and isolated them and sometimes we read about them cutting themselves and living in the tombs and even though they're alive physically they're dead spiritually and so they brought this man and the they it doesn't say it but it's implied that they brought this man to Jesus because they had faith that Jesus could do something about it and when the demon was cast out, that's just it. I mean, Matthew's is so simple in it. And when the demon was cast out, and it means actually forced to evacuate. I like that. Jesus, the, the deaf mute man is brought up, and what does he do? He cast out the devil. Leave. I mean, something like that. Leave. Or Jesus could have just looked at him, and he's like, I'm out of here. Whatever the case may be. Sometimes he would touch them. Sometimes he would speak to the demon. And sometimes it could just be his very presence. Demons knew who Jesus was. And they know who Jesus is today. And so they are forced to evacuate. The mute spoke. Here, I believe, even though the they had faith, that Jesus is not so much responding to their faith as he's responding to the need. You see the difference? So I'm not, yes, he does respond to our faith, but there are times when we're unable to have faith that he will respond to the need. He forcibly uh, makes the demon evacuate, and the tongue is loosed, and the ears are open, and he begins to speak. How long was he this way? Well, it definitely wasn't from birth because it's indicated that it was a demon that inhabited him that made him speechless, that made him deaf. Was it a month? Was it a year? Was it 30 years? Was it 40 years? All I know is that however long it was, in one moment, in one moment, that demon left and he began to speak. What was his first words? I'm hungry. <laughs> I don't know. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know. But here Jesus responded to the need. Listen, when we're broken in our life and we're going through a very, very difficult time, it's hard to have faith. And you hear about these people come along and they tell you about, you have to have faith, you have to have faith, you have to have faith. And there's no doubt that Jesus responds to faith. But there are numerous accounts in the New Testament where faith is not mentioned at all and Jesus still heals. I believe he responds to our brokenness. I believe he's drawn to our need. I believe that he does this because he loves you. Again, he loves the terrorist, he loves the adulterer, he loves the murderer, he loves the racist, he loves the anarchist, he loves the power-hungry man, he loves the sexually seducing woman, he loves everybody. And he's drawn to our need. And there's no doubt that demons are at work today, and there's no doubt for the unbelieving world that they many times can control them. And Jesus has come not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. I, see, I have to remind myself of that because it's easy for me to get angry when I see what's happening to the cities of our nation. And I have to remember that's broken people. Doesn't make it right what they're doing, but they're broken. And what they need is Jesus. They need more than clothes. They need more than food. They need more than money. They need more than job. They need more than respect. They need Jesus. And Jesus is able to forcefully evacuate that which controls them so they can speak and they can 
begin to build instead of tear down and destroy. And the multitudes marveled, saying, it was never seen like this in Israel. Well, I guess they weren't there at Jairus' house, and maybe they weren't there when the leper was cleansed. But the multitudes, you know how they go? They come and they go, they come and they go, and they said, I've never, we've never seen anything like this before. And the Pharisees have a, <laughs> have a problem now because there's no doubt a miracle has been done. The Pharisees said, he cast out demon by the ruler of demons. So they're like, well, yeah, there's a miracle, but he does it by the power of Beelzebub. He's of the devil. And Jesus deals with that later. But as we come to the close tonight, what we have here, Jesus writes these things to show us that there's no need, no brokenness so great and so severe that he cannot heal and he cannot make whole. He has the power over sickness. He has the power over disease. He has the power over storms and disasters. He has the powers over spirit and the supernatural. He has the powers over our brokenness and our disabilities. He has all power, and he is able and willing to meet you at your point of need in your brokenness to embrace you and to restore you and to make you whole. I leave you with this tonight, and it's from the book of Romans, and it had to do with the life of Abraham, and it's Romans 4 and 20. It said, Abraham, when he was well past childbearing age, God made a promise that he would have descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And Romans says this about Abraham, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. I want to say to you tonight, when you have a word from the Lord, and we do have a word from the Lord, it's right here, a word from the Lord, do not waver at the promise of God in unbelief. Stop fearing, be believing. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Maybe it's time to unplug from certain voices and certain things so you can be strengthened in your faith and plug into God's word, plug into worship, plug into Christian fellowship. Giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Father, we bless your name tonight and we just thank you that in the midst of our brokenness, you have come to give us life and life more abundantly. Lord, we uh, just pray for the peace of the cities of our nation. We pray for the peace of those who are just literally trapped in sin, Lord. And some trapped by supernatural spirit, the devil himself, Lord. There's no doubt about it. What we're seeing in our world is Satan like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But you have come to give life and life more abundantly. And Lord, we thank you that you embraced us in our brokenness. You came and touched us when we were spiritually unclean. We thank you, Lord, that you were not disgusted by us nor turned away from us, but you came to us and embraced us. And we who were unholy were made holy by you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you guys. Jesus, lover of my soul, Jesus. I will never let you go You've taken me From the miry clay You set my feet upon a rock And now I know I love you I need you Though my world may fall I'll never let you go my Savior, my closest friend, and I will worship you until the very end. God bless you, Calvary family. We'll see you Sunday morning, 10 a.m. and 12 o'clock on campus or online. God bless you, church.